right. call this meeting of Labor and Industry Finance Policy Committee to order. Um, we have a quorum, and uh, Rip Daniels, I understand, will be meeting, joining us on the phone. Um, hey, he's there now. Okay, good. Welcome, Rip Daniels. Um, first order of business is the uh, minutes. And Representative Jordan, did you get a chance to look at the minutes? I did, Mr. Chair, and I would move their approval. Our motion is made to move the approval of the minutes from April 18th, 2024. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> the ayes have it. Um, um, Come on over. <laughs> anyway, uh, on the agenda today is House File 4746, Representative Hus Hussein's uh, Hassan, Hassan, Hassan yeah, yeah, Hussein and Hussein, they're, they're, never, they're by, right by each other, so I missed, read the wrong name. Move, Representative Hassan moves that the uh, 4746 be re referred to Ways and Means. Welcome to the committee, Representative Hussein. Hassan. Hassan. You're Hassan. <laughs> He's Hussein. Hussein. I'm Hussein. Hussein is the motion maker. Hussein is the mo I'm sorry. They're, they're side by side here, and I'm looking at the wrong one. Representative Hus Hussein moves the House Fall 4746 to be re referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Welcome to the committee, Representative Hassan. And I apologize for the next mess up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No problem. It's the late nights, I, I, I suppose. Yes. Uh, late nights? Week. <laughs> Staying up all, all night and then coming back here early in the morning, it's not fun. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members, and thank you for the opportunity to present House File 4746, uh, the TNC bill, a.k.a. Uber and Lyft bill. I first want to extend my uh, gratitude towards all the drivers and advocates who have tirelessly worked on this bill for two years in a row. I uh, also want to thank our Commissioner of DLI, Nicole Blissenberg, who has done tremendous work uh, to advocate for the drivers and engage all stakeholders. And then I also want to thank all the task force members who have spent their summer and fall uh, last year trying to strike a balance uh, between fair wages and, uh, you know, uh, business model that works for uh, the TNCs. Um, my biggest gratitude goes to uh, our nonpartisan and partisan staff who have done countless changes to this bill. Thank you, Marta, for all your work on this. Um, and I also want to thank our majority leader, uh, Leader Long, and his staff, Paul Cumming and Isabel Ruth, for their dedication, support, and guidance with, uh, and keeping us on task. This is a unique bill. There are no interest groups or lobbyists pushing this bill. It's um, <coughs> grassroots advocates who are drivers who has came to us and told us there's a problem with their line of work and we need to support them. Um, Minnesota has a long history of supporting workers and protecting um, workers. I believe we have one of the toughest uh, wage theft laws. And I proudly say that I was in the House when that bill was passed uh, <coughs> by Chair Mahoney. This bill before you today it's mostly the task force recommendations, and we will adopt the DE, and Martha will uh, do a walkthrough of the DE. It's mostly the recommendations from the task force. The few items that are not from the task force recommendations are the weights, which were not agreed upon, uh, enforcement, which were not agreed upon, and arbitrations. The reason why enforcement and arbitrations are important is the drivers need protection. We have heard last year, every committee that bill, this bill went to, and we will, get, we, will, we will hear today as well from the drivers, that people were robbed, beaten, gunned down, and left for dead. While they lay in bed at the hospital, Uber and Lyft deactivated their apps so they can no longer work, instead of supporting the people that were doing work for them. So that's the reason why we're keeping the enforcement and the arbitrations. Um, according to the DLI study, I want to just share a few numbers with you. Uh, according to the DLA study, uh, these drivers are 91% male, 61% black, 61% foreign born, 
48% have high school diploma or less. 39% are under the 200% uh, of poverty, uh, federal poverty level. 18% rely on SNAP or food stamps. 28% receive Medicaid. 14% have no insurance. 11% work 10 hours or less. Uh, and almost 41% or more work 32 hours or more. Reason why I'm sharing these numbers is to underline the importance of protecting these members of our community who are predominantly BIPOC, new Americans, low income, and deserving of our protections. This isn't a part-time job for some folks doing it on a spare time. However, it's a full-time job for 41% of the drivers, many of them raising large families with few dollars, and they make in the few dollars that they make in long hours driving Uber and Lyft. House File 4746 um, seeks to respond to practices that companies like Uber and Lyft and others employ to lower costs and undercut their rivals. Those cost-cutting measures often come <coughs> at the expense of workers who receive low wages and are often misled regarding their pay and responsibilities as drivers with little recourse against the companies. With that, Mr. Chair, I want to say this bill is about justice, it's about protection for protected class. It's about defending the people from greed. Um, Minnesota has a great history of protecting workers, and I hope we can continue that today. Uh, with that, Mr. Uh, Chair, I would like to uh, somebody move the DE before the committee. And we have a DE 12 amendment, and Representative Hussein moves the DE 12 amendment. And if we can have our staff walk us through that, the, the amendment does. <clears throat> Mr. Chair and members, I will go through the DE-12. Uh, so this bill creates a new chapter that would regulate transportation network companies, or otherwise referred to as TNCs. Uh, there are several provisions, like Representative Hassan said, from the uh, report recommendations. Section 1 provides a new uh, blanket accident insurance policy for drivers that the TNCs would be responsible for at no cost to the drivers and provides the requirements for what that um, policy would need to look like, as well as clarifying language for the auto insurance existing language. Uh, section 2 provides the definitions that will use, be used in the chapter. Wherever possible, existing def definitions uh, from existing law were used. Section 3 provides notice and pay transparency requirements. The TNCs will be required to provide several notices to TNC drivers. Uh, these would relate to minimum compensation, daily trip assignments, uh, daily and weekly receipts, and any rights and remedies available under the chapter. Section 4 provides minimum compensation for TNC drivers. I would note that there are numbers in this version, uh, and so the numbers in this version are $1.27 per mile and $0.91 cents per minute. There's also um, an upcharge for any wheelchair accessible vehicles. And, at, and any ride would require um, a $5 minimum payment, and there's also language for a cancellation fee. Section 5 uh, is a new uh, deactivation section that provides several requirements um, related to deactivation of drivers. Uh, TNCs would be required to provide a written and easy to understand deact deactivation policy. And that would outline um, when or how they can suspend or terminate a driver's ability to work for the TNC. And this would include things like reasons, length of deactivation, a definition of serious misconduct, as well as the timelines and process for notices and appeals. There's also a provision that would require a TNC to contract with a nonprofit driver advocacy group for driver assistance services. Section 6 provides enforcement. Uh, DLI would have enforcement over the labor provisions. And this also makes clear that any contract provision that would violate this chapter uh, could be uh, pursued in district court. And any retaliation or discrimination against the drivers is prohibited um, both in Section 6 and in Section 7. <clears throat> Section 8 is a clarifying provision that indicates that there's no impact on existing collective bargaining agreements or the employment or non-employment status of a TNC driver. Section 9 is a new arbitration section. And uh, while drivers would be allowed to opt out of arbitration, uh, it also establishes the requirements that would apply um, for an arbitration between a driver and a TNC in Minnesota and under the uh, rights and remedies of this new chapter. Uh, Section 10 is uh, 
a provision that allows a city or county to revoke a license to operate for a TNC if they do not comply with this law. And finally, Section 11 is an appropriation for DLI uh, related to their enforcement of the compensation and notice and pay transparency requirements. Happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. James. Um, first person we have on our list to testify is the uh, Commissioner of Department of Labor and Industry, Ms. Blissenbach. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Nelson. Uh, members of the committee, my name is Nicole Blissenbach and I'm the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on House File 4746. Um, DLI has been engaging stakeholders on this topic for the la over the last year through directives of the Governor's Executive Order 2307, which was issued in May of 2023. The executive order established a committee on the compensation, well-being, and fair treatment of transportation network company drivers. The TNC committee met over the course of six months to collect and discuss information related to the working conditions of TNC drivers and to draft recommendations related to the compensation and fair treatment of TNC drivers. <clears throat> the work of the committee concluded in December 2023 with a set of 24 consensus recommendations to the governor. Importantly, the committee was made up of 15 members, including TNC representatives, TNC drivers, drivers representatives, local and state government leaders, and other stakeholders. Commissioner Arnold from the Department of Commerce and I served as co-chairs of the committee. During public meetings, our committee heard directly from drivers, companies, cities, and driver representatives about the experiences of driving for a TNC in Minnesota. The committee organized the consensus recommendations around five topic areas, pay transparency, minimum compensation, deactivation and due process, driver support, and insurance. The administration fully supports the consensus recommendations outlined in the committee report, and I am pleased that the recommendations are largely reflected in House File 4746. I do want to spend some time talking about the portions of the bill that reflect those recommendations. These recommendations are evidence that the committee members came to the table in good faith and reached an agreement on policies that promote fairness and transparency for TNC drivers that reflect driver experience and were informed by challenging discussions and robust stakeholder input. <clears throat> Section one of House File 4746 contains language that reflects the consensus recommendation related to insurance. The importance of this item cannot be understated. The insurance as reflected in this, pr in this bill provides some of the most protective insurance coverage for TNC drivers in the country at no cost to the drivers. This recommendation and resulting bill language addresses a need that the committee heard in testimony from drivers, and I am pleased that the insurance provision of this bill has broad support. Section three of House File 4746 contains language that reflects eight consensus recommendations related to pay transparency. This language ensures that the TNC drivers receive relevant information related to driver compensation, information necessary for a driver to decide if they want to accept a trip offer, detailed trip receipts, and weekly summaries. Section five contains language that reflects seven consensus recommendations related to deactivation and due process. This language ensures that drivers will not be subject to unwarranted deactivations by requiring TNCs to have deactivation policies that outline conduct that will subject a driver to a deactivation. This language will also require warnings prior to deactivation except for in the case of serious misconduct. The language requires that notices of deactivation include relevant information and that there be a process to challenge or appeal a deactivation. Section five also contains language that reflects two consensus recommendations related to driver support by requiring TNCs to contract with a driver advocacy organization that will assist drivers with deactivation appeals and other issues related to being a TNC driver. Section four contains language that reflects five consensus <coughs> recommendations related to minimum compensation, including minimum compensation in a per minute per mile format, 
the ability for the TNC to provide minimum compensation over a two week period and an annual adjustment to that minimum compensation. As to the minimum compensation rates, Executive Order 2307 directed DLI to commission and oversee a study to obtain and analyze data inf and information related to the working conditions of TNC drivers in Minnesota. That study report was published on March 8th of 2024. That report offers a range of pay standard options to calculate a minimum compensation for TNC drivers that ensures drivers are making minimum wage and costs out basic expenses and more comprehensive benefit expenses. The analysis used Minnesota TNC trip data from 2022, a data set of more than 18 million rides, a TNC driver survey, and Minnesota specific expenses and benefits data to determine a range of options for a, to inform a pay standard. The study separated trips in greater Minnesota and the seven county metro area, which accounted the greater, or the seven county metro area accounted for 95% of the rides. Based on the data provided, the study shows that to ensure drivers in the seven county metro are making Minneapolis minimum wage of 1557 per hour with necessary expenses like vehicle, gas, and cell phone, drivers would need to be paid 49 cents per minute and 89 cents per mile. Based on 2022 average trip earnings and 2022 average P3 minutes and miles, this base minimum compensation rate would result in a 10% increase to driver compensation. If expenses for additional benefits were taken into consideration for things like unemployment insurance, health insurance, paid time off, and retirement savings, a more comprehensive rate, a per mile rate, would need to be increased. The administration remains committed to engaging with stakeholders and the authors to build agreement on a pay standard that ensures drivers are paid fairly and will keep these important services available to the citizens of Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, and then I was just informed that Ms. James has to correct one thing she said in her, her remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify there for the record, I mo misspoke about the minis mini excuse me, minimum compensation amount. So it's $1.27 <coughs> per mile and 49 cents per minute. And then the 91 cents per mile is for any wheelchair accessible vehicle. Thank you. And um, why don't we why don't we adopt the DE amendment and then we'll go to testifiers. Um, all in favor of the DE 12 as described, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The uh, DE is adopted. Um, I have a long list of testifiers here and just want to tell people <coughs> two to three minutes. We have to be out here at 1030 because we have session at 11. And so and we will be taking a vote on this. 20 minutes after, um, and if, some, if we're in the middle of a discussion or whatever, we're going to take a vote. Um, so keep your keep your comments short if you can. And uh, with that, uh, I've got the first person on my list is Sueb Muhammad. And I hope I said your first name right. I Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record, and then you can proceed. Hi, my name is Shuai Mohammed. I'm from Minnesota Red Share Drivers Association. Uh, today, our testimony <coughs> that we are advocating clear language that explicitly states uh, the drivers are not employees for transportation, uh, network company TNCs, and to, ensure, and to ensure that the complete support for law benefit for all bodies, including and consumer uh, groups, uh, and the companies. It is vital to establish a common grounds. Last year, negotiation between Merda and Huber sets a rate at $1.17 uh, cent per mile and $0.34 cent per minute. That could significantly increase the driver's earning currently with the rate of uh, 0.60 cent per mile and $0.18 cent per minute. That's ample room for improvement. <coughs> Uh, by voting to $1.17 cent per minute and uh, $0.34 cent per, uh, per minute, uh, $1.17 cent, uh, $1 cent per mile and uh, $0.34 cent per mile, earning that could be potentially double 
with the estimate of 500 trips daily, average five miles and 10 minutes each that that this adjusts the cost of drivers earning uh, to 1.7 billion compared to the current uh, 18, uh, 800 million. Uh, the rest I will yield to my uh, uh, friend, Omar Adam, the president of Minnesota Red Share Drivers Association. I yield back to you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Omar Adin, and then I have after that, <coughs> Mohammed Egal. Again, welcome to the committee. State your name for the record. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for having me and the committee members. My name is Omar Ahmed, Omar Aden Ahmed. Aden is the middle name. My, my last Boston last name is Omar Ahmed. Uh, uh, I will take less than one minute, less than two minutes. For the record, uh, the drivers, as stated by uh, Rep. Hodan Hassan, are human beings, uh, family owners, uh, people, uh, immigrants, people who have actually uh, put in, working day in, day out to make uh, to put food on the table for their families. They go through challenges, and it's very important that uh, we pass, uh, the committee passes a bill to make sure that uh, their life and their, their, their life continues. Uh, the situation has been back and forth for the last uh, two years. There have been a lot of issues. Uh, I will support this bill. Uh, it, as it underscores the considerable benefit for all parties involved and enhances the like, like, likelihood of gubernatorial approval for the proposed law. It's crucial that all stakeholders, including consumer advocacy, drivers, and TNC companies are involved in discussions. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, have, let's learn from the past mistakes, leveraging the murder uber agreement as a foundation for progress. Any digit agrees and upon must take must be driver take home. That's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Mohammed Egal. And after that, I have <coughs> Abdir Rashad Mohammed. And welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and proceed. Yeah, my name is Mohammed Egal uh, from Molda Members uh, Driver Ad Advocacy Group. Uh, I'm here today to testify in good faith, helping drivers. Um, the bill went through many parts. Now this portion is the most important part, the compensation part. If you want to know this case, the truth of the matter, I think it's very easy for each representative to go and find the data by themselves. It's very easy. You can see the tax return <coughs> over the net height. They show how much driver made last year, how much they made. Each driver can bring you and can show you what they made and how much they get from it. You can see it in front of your eyes. It's very easy. So if somebody says, data says 89 cents, data says 130, data says all these data are not really <clears throat> true. The number that we, multi members, we proposed 130 per mile and 40 cents per minute <clears throat> to the task force and also to the House representatives. We saw that number was really a number that was very reasonable, a number that can be agreed upon. It was very, very good number. Now, just yesterday, one of our friends, state representatives, some Senate, you know, people, people came from the Senate, uh, they agreed to take a number that's a little lower, 127. 127, why they take 127, why they didn't take 130, we didn't know. But anyway, in order to become, come along and agree on something, we support that number. We support that number because of the driver's, you know, well-being. So I'm here to testify and support the number 127 per mile <coughs> and, uh, and 49 cents per minute that some senators and some driver groups 
agree upon yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Abdi Rashad Mohammed, and after that I have Joel Carlson. Dear, welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm a Muldo member. Um, Can you state oh, my, name is, my name is Abdul Shad Hussein Mohammed of Muldo members. Um, I was driving an uh, Uber driver almost six, seven years. Um, and to be honest, you know, the, the way uh, both companies these days, they, um, I, I just, I call them, you know, just like ripping off. So I, I have some conversation with, with the passengers. So, and I found that what they're taking from the, <coughs> uh, the rider and what they're giving us, there's, there's a big gap. Um, and as you know, uh, living cost is very high these days. Uh, inflation, gas price. So everything is on us except um, the dispatch. That's, and that's what I call it. They, they, they only make connection. <coughs> but they, we don't, they don't pay us the way they pay us even <coughs> a few months ago. Every single day, the pay cut's still going up. And they're not even backing down. Um, they're taking advantage of us. And sometimes they even they say that, you know, uh, when, when, we, when, we, when we receive a ride, including the tip, these days even riders don't tip a lot because they're already, already being, charged, being charged very high price. So there's, there's not much even tip there. So it's very difficult as drivers um, to earn, uh, you know, what are you supposed to add? So my testimony is, uh, as the Muslim members, we uh, support dollar 30 cent and 49 cent per, uh, 30 cent per mile and 49 cent per minute. And I hope all representatives will support us. And you know, as as a driver, and every single day, even I can't even afford my, even if I want to repair my car these days, because of the 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 cut the big cut they just doing these two companies. So, for example, a few days ago, I pick up a passenger from airport. I drove her like five miles, and they charge her forty five dollar. <coughs> And she was asking how much am I, am I going to get that, you know, that amount. And I told, when, I told, when I told her, she was, she was like, wow, is this the way they're going rip, to be ripping you off? They pay me, pay me eight dollars of that. And they just keep, you know, um, most of the amount, which is not fair. So I'm, I'm asking everyone, uh, uh, all representatives here to support us. So we can we can make you know uh, the decent decent money. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Uh, Joel Carlson, and after that after that I have John Reich. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and proceed. <coughs> Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm Joel Carlson. I own a legal research and government affairs business here in St. Paul, and I represent Uber Technologies, a company I've represented since they first operated uh, in Minnesota in about 2012. Um, and Mr. Chair, I appreciate being in front of you. This is probably the last time I'll get a chance to be in front of you. Thank you for all of your service and friendship over uh, our tenure. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Um, as uh, Commissioner Blissenbach mentioned, we have been actively engaged uh, uh, with the state and the drivers and legislators to try and 
uh, address uh, differences uh, in, w within the TNC market. And we actively participated in that task force and, and Uber and Lyft support all 24 of the consensus recommendations. Many of them are in this bill. Um, a couple of them aren't, and we want to talk about those. Um, but we, uh, most of the bill that is in front of you is comes to you with agreement. And I want to point out, uh, to be efficient, Mr. Chair, I want to point out uh, where the disagreements are so that you know. Uh, but, you know, the first seven pages of the 16-page bill on insurance, which there isn't another product like it in the country, uh, we are in agreement with the first seven pages of the bill. The deactivation language, the pay transparency, the $5 minimum compensation, uh, all of those things we have long agreed to and quite frankly are already in place. Uh, so we have some disagreements with uh, particularly enfor the enforcement provision and the compensation that's in this, in this bill. And we uh, provided the state of Minnesota <laughs> the information on 18 million rides, including the car, the trip time, the amount of distance. Uh, it is the most significant TNC rate study in the country that has ever been done in this business. Um, and uh, once that report set um, um, a, an earnings amount, which is on uh, page 29 of the report, they found that uh, Metro drivers make on, on average $52.94 um, uh, an hour when working, having a passenger in the car. If you take that down to uh, when they're going to get a passenger uh, and have a passenger in the car, the number in the report is about $35 an hour. Uh, once they set that, though, they take we, we think is an unfair turn uh, in the reporting calculating expenses. And that is where our biggest disagreement is. Um, you know, we, um, uh, we disagree uh, that the rate in the report at 49 cents a mile and, uh, and uh, 89 cents a minute uh, accurately reflects the cost to operate a vehicle. And we think when you appropriately discount P1 time, which no rate in the country um, compensates um, a, uh, a TNC driver simply when their app is on, which this report does. When you look at the car expenses that are allowed, this assumes that a driver drives 35,000 miles, gives them full deduction for every mile. It gives them full um, uh, self-employment tax. So I'm glad that they're affirming that these are independent contractors. But we think that the assumptions in the report on expenses are just too much. And Uber has calculated that if you uh, reasonably calculate the expenses, you come up with a rate of 41 cents a mile uh, and 69, uh, 68 cents a, a minute. Um, and that we think is um, an accurate reflection of the, of the reports. The rate that is in the DE amendment uh, at $1.27 a minute is just not supportable economically. And we are not writing on a blank sheet of paper. We have this experience uh, in other cities. And we know that when you price rides out of the reach of riders, that utilization goes down. And so you might make a little bit more um, on the few trips you get. But overall, the, the drivers in Seattle right now uh, make less than the drivers in Minneapolis under the current rates. And the rebound in Seattle from where we were pre-pandemic after they put these rates in effect, they have less than 50% of the rides in Seattle than they had pre-pandemic. There is a direct relationship to cost and, and riders utilizing the service. And you also need to know that Seattle has an extremely different um, uh, average household income of about $103,000. Minneapolis, it's about $56,000. So even in that city, people are not using the service the way they once did. Um, we have offered um, in the past to move away from a um, con confusing uh, per mile per minute that's based on expenses and just offer a flat uh, hourly guarantee. And in New York State, we agreed to an hourly guarantee of $26 an hour for, for all P2 and P3 time. Uh, and that's easier to understand, and we would go back to that, and we'll put that on the table. But what is in this report we think is business ending uh, for Minnesota, and we can't support it at the level that it's at. Um, as to enforcement, uh, Mr. Chair and members, 
46 states have statewide regulations of this business, 46 states. Minnesota, South Dakota, Illinois, and Oregon are the only states that have a local regulation. And we support those local regulations to a point. <coughs> we don't have local regulation for insurance. And as we move into this uh, model of having a minimum compensation standard and the deactivations, we think we need a statewide system and that we need statewide enforcement. There are a couple things in the bill that move us away from that, Mr. Chair, if you want, I'll briefly mention them. Um, right. Yep, and I, and I appreciate um, our conversation about time. So, uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, on, uh, uh, on page uh, 13, line 13.30, as uh, Representative Hassan noted, you are on the DE-12. We've gone through this bill a lot. But in this version for the first time uh, on 13.30, on uh, it used to say that we needed to um, review and respond to an appeal within 15 days. This version says we have to review and rule on an appeal in 15 days. I think rule needs to be respond. We cannot make a determination within 15 days where we need to get more information from a driver to defend themselves after we, re after we receive the case. I think respond uh, instead of rule on 13.30, um, which has been the case in D1 through 11, uh, 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 is, the right, uh, is the right verbiage there. The other issue that we have is that we would like to have the commissioner have exclusive authority to implement this chapter and the insurance provisions in this bill. And the on, on 14.25, uh, we have a, I don't want to disagree with you, author. We actually have an agreement on the arbitration provisions. We're in agreement on that. What is on 14.25 that allows the driver to bring an action in district court conflicts with the arbitration provision. When you sign up as a driver, you have a choice. I can uh, make a decision to go to district court or I can arbitrate. Um, and you make that election on your own. Um, this basically says that the, your agreement to arbitrate um, is, is not valid because you can go to district court in every case, even though you've elected arbitration. This is a, runs afoul of the Federal Arbitration Act, and we just think that sentence should be, should be stricken. Mr. Chair, members, we're happy to answer questions. We want to have this issue resolved. We've worked diligently to make that happen. Uh, we think we can get there. Uh, we're just not quite there yet. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Carlson. Uh, the next person I have on my list is John Reich. And then after that, I have Trevor Turner. Welcome to the committee. Again, state your name for the record and proceed. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. My name is John Reich with Cozen County Public Strategies in Minneapolis, and we represent Lyft in Minnesota. First, I want to thank Representative Hassan and Representative Noor and others for their continued conversations on this particular issue. I know that they have been engaged on this for over a year, and I would say that Lyft has also been engaged during that same time to try to reconcile this issue and come to a conclusion on this matter such that we can remain in the market have a robust business and drivers can also benefit from the bill. We support the policy goal of providing drivers a minimum earning standard and we want to see drivers do well. We are pro-driver. If we're not pro-driver, the whole system doesn't work. We want to see our drivers do well and we want to resolve this issue in a fashion that benefits everybody. For the past year, we've worked in good faith with stakeholders towards that goal. Lyft represented Representatives participated in the governor's task force, helped inform the task force discussions, <clears throat> provided detailed public presentations on insurance, deactivation, and the deactivation appeals process. In addition, as Mr. Carlson mentioned, Lyft and Uber provided an unprecedented amount of data to the state, 18 million rides during calendar year 2022, so that the state could provide a wage analysis based on real and actual data. <clears throat> The engagement, both at the task force, with drivers and others during the past eight months, has yielded some important changes to Lyft's platform. Lyft now guarantees a $5 minimum fare. 
We've also instituted in February of this year a driver pay guarantee that ensures that drivers earn at least 70% or more of fares each week after external fees. So if you've driven all week and after fees, you've not received 70% of the fare in aggregate, Lyft will top you up to ensure that you do meet that 70% threshold. I think that's an important issue for drivers to understand that they're going to make at least 70% and there's some transparency around those fares. Third, we've instituted pay transparency on the app where new earnings summary in the Lyft app shows drivers a breakdown of where every cent of the rider fare goes. And then lastly, we've instituted a streamlined in-app button for drivers to appeal deactivation decisions. The new channel gives drivers the ability to provide Lyft with new or updated information as well as direct access to a specialized support team dedicated to the deactivation appeals. Mr. Carlson also mentioned the accident and sickness policy provision in section one of the bill that we've also agreed to with the authors. That is really important coverage that was agreed to as part of the task force recommendations that will provide drivers protections if they're hurt on the job. That includes while driving with passengers as well as any intentional act immediately upon drop off. It's really important benefit for drivers. We support it, but we should note that there is a cost <coughs> associated with that insurance. By our estimation, it could increase fares by 22%. And finally, Mr. Chair and members, Lyft offered, most recently offered to agree to the rate which the state's own study says it is necessary to meet the policy goal of a minimum wage equal to Minneapolis. There are a couple <coughs> items in the bill, as Mr. Carlson mentioned, I won't belabor them, but we also have issues with, specifically the rate. The rate in the bill, as it stands, exceeds the range that was part of Department of Labor and Industries study. The range in the study went from 89 cents a mile to 49 cents a minute, which would meet the policy goal of matching the Minneapolis minimum wage, although we think that's extraordinarily generous given how the inputs uh, related to that are calculated, but the top range at 120.49. The rate in the bill exceeds the top range in the Dolly study by seven cents. And again, that study was based on 18 million rides over the calendar year 2022. The 127.49 does not work for Lyft. Combined with the insurance provisions, the rate would nearly double the cost of a ride, cause, in our estimation, nearly a 60% drop in ride requests, and associated with that, a 33% reduction in driver pay. Drivers would make more per ride, but there would be fewer rides for the drivers to take. The fundamental issue here, members, and Mr. Chair, is <coughs> How to... We're going to come to a conclusion. Thank you. I, absolutely. As Mr. Carlson mentioned, there is a fine line between raising costs for the companies through insurance or pay versus then the fares increasing so much for price sensitive or folks who just simply can't afford it. And that's what we've seen. And that's what we think we'll see. Unfortunately, uh, the rate in the bill now would cause Lyft to leave Minnesota entirely. And with that, Mr. Chair, I will wrap my comments and stand for any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Um, the next person is Trevor Turner. And then after that, I have Eid Ali. Mr. Turner, state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. My name is Trevor Turner, and I am the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. Um, and I'm here to support a specific provision in the DE amendment for House File 4746, and that is Section 4 under minimum compensation. Um, that part would give an additional 91 cents per mile to drivers who have a wheelchair accessible vehicle. Um, this is really important because in, uh, the, the Americans with Disabilities Act requires taxi companies to have wheelchair accessible vehicles and provide that service. However, uh, Uber and Lyft do not consider themselves to be taxi companies and then do not comply to that uh, standard on the ADA. Uh, however, Uber and Lyft do directly compete with taxis as they have the Star Tribune reported that, uh, you know, in 2015, there were over almost 1,400 different taxis in Minneapolis alone. Um, and then now there are less than a dozen. Um, and only a few of those are wheelchair accessible vehicles. Uh, Uber and Lyft right now, if you open up their apps, you aren't able to get a wheelchair accessible vehicle. Um, there are the option there, but it takes you to a third party website where to a company that only operates eight to five, uh, Monday through Friday and on weekend appointment only. 
And for us, we care really deeply about having equitable service. Um, the, this whole debate of the TNC companies has been largely centered around how it will impact people with disabilities. And I, as someone who's legally blind and doesn't drive, that is, includes me. I use Uber and Lyft all the time to get around. Um, it's provided me a great sense of being able to uh, go all over the cross the metro where metro transit doesn't go. And so I would really hate to see Uber and Lyft leave. However, uh, I also would like to see that there would be equitable service for all people with disabilities, inclu including wheelchair users. As right now, if you're a wheelchair user, you're excluded from uh, the service entirely. And so I'm hoping that this uh, incentive, this extra pay incentive will encourage uh, and incentivize drivers to uh, get on the road and <coughs> provide the service for uh, wheelchair users as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it, I'm skeptical that it's enough. I do think that the state may need to do more to provide tax credits or incentives uh, to help people get wheelchair accessible vehicles or modify their vehicles to be wheelchair accessible vehicles. But um, I think this is a really good first step. <coughs> so uh, I really appreciate and thank uh, Representative Hassan, Representative North, uh, and Majority Leader Long for including this in the in the bill, and um, I hope that it can, we can continue the conversation to provide equitable service for wheelchair users in this state. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Eid Ali, and then the next I have Stephen Cooper. Take your name for the record and proceed. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chair and, and, and the members. Um, my name is uh, Eid Ali, and I am uh, the president of Minnesota Uber and Lyft Drivers Association, also known Mulda. Today I stand before you not only as a representative of our association, but also as a voice for the thousands of Uber and Lyft drivers across our state who tirelessly navigate our streets to provide essential transportation services. Over the past two years, MOLDA has been unwavering in its dedication to advocating for the rights and fair treatment of these hardworking drivers. These individuals, many of whom are black and brown, devote countless hours to their profession often facing formidable challenges along the way. From adverse weather condition to encounter with passengers, they preserve in their commitment to supporting their families and communities. However, despite their dedication and the vital role they play in our transportation ecosystem, Uber and Lyft drivers have been subject to exploitation for too long. It's no secret that those two multi-billion dollar corporations have profited immensely while neglecting the well-being and livelihood of those who fuel their success. Today, I implore each of you to recognize the urgency of the situation at hand and to take decisive action in support of fair wages for Uber and Lyft drivers. The legislation before you <coughs> presents an opportunity to rectify the injustice, the injustices that have persisted for too long. By passing this legislation, you will not only ensure fair compensation for these drivers, but also affirm our collective commitment to equity and justice in the labor market. I urge you to consider the profound impact that your decision will have on the lives of uh, countless individuals who depend on their earnings for driving to make ends meet. Let's stand together in solidarity with Uber and Lyft drivers, send a clear message that exploitation has no place in our society. In conclusion, I humbly implore you to fulfill your duty as stewards of labor and industry by supporting and passing this critical legislation today. The future of thousands of hardworking drivers and their families hang in the balance, in the balance, and it's within your power to enact positive change. Thank you so much, and thank you for considering to pass this legislation. Again, I want to add one more thing. I was one of those people who were sitting, I was part of the task force who has been sitting for five months 
to get some uh, relief for those drivers next to Uber and Lyft and some other um, honorable folks. And we have tried every venue to make sure that we are going to get some sort of reconciliation with Uber and Lyft. There is no any number that will satisfy Uber and Lyft. But all of these drivers who are sitting right over there are waiting and want to see you stand with them and give them the rights uh, they deserve. All they are asking today is just fairness and fair wage for them. Thank you so much. Next I have Stephen Cooper. Thank you for your testimony. Um, and then after that, Farhan Badal. <coughs> And again, two to three minutes, keep, keep it short. Thank you, uh, members of the committee, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple of things I want to go back to that Uber said uh, that were just incorrect. Please state your name for the record. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm Stephen Cooper. I've appeared before you all before, and I'm the legal representative for Malda. Now, a quick thing. You heard from Malda Association and Malda. They're two different groups. The first four speakers or three speakers you heard from are an entirely different group than the speaker you just heard from. The speaker you just heard from is the one that's been spearheading this bill from the beginning. They all agree, though. I'm not suggesting there's a disagreement. I'm just pointing out that there's two different organizations. Uh, one thing I want to point out is during the summer, a number of things were agreed to. Those were the easy things. The tough things remain. Since the, since the summer happened, there have been, what, dozens at least meetings or, or exchanges of information back between Uber and Lyft and the legislators. And this, this has caused the, the drivers to compromise on a wide range of things. And also Uber to compromise, and Lyft, I'm sorry, to compromise on some things. What we have left when we talk about the prices, let's talk about the study. There were two studies done by Minneapolis. There was a study done by uh, Seattle. There was a study done by New York. And there was a study done by Chicago. And none of them agree with the Minnesota study. And the reason they don't agree is they're focusing on the wrong thing. And when uh, Joel spoke, he focused on the wrong thing, too. It's not the number of people you looked at. It's what did you use as the assumption about ch what it costs the drivers. The drivers pay for everything. They pay for the cars, they pay for the gas, they pay for the repairs, they pay for everything. <coughs> Uber just provides the software. And that software is identical to the software, not identical, but similar to the software by other PNCs who are planning on coming here if they actually leave. One of them has 100,000 drivers. Others are, are, have multiple drivers. So if Uber actually leaves, which I think would be business silly, if Uber actually leaves, there is a replacement. But let's go back to the assumptions in the study. <coughs> they assume 31.5 miles per gallon. Just mind, how many of you get 31.5 miles per gallon? Beyond assuming 31.5, <laughs> we got one. <laughs> Beyond the 31.5 miles per gallon, how many of you are in stop and go traffic, picking up passengers, dropping off pack passengers, picking up the 31.5 miles per gallon was below what the feds say it is, and it was a made-up number that came from nowhere. It was not an, Now, why is that important? The thing that I mentioned a minute ago is the drivers pay all the expenses. What Uber skipped when they said they make 35 cents an hour or $35 an hour or whatever is from that is taken the total cost of operating that car and they're driving about 150 miles a day, half of which isn't compensated at all. The study said about 44% of the time they're not being compensated. So when you're driving to pick somebody up, no compensation. When you're waiting for them to come out, no compensation. The only compensation is when you're driving. They want to ignore that fact. When you actually compute what they offered with their $26, that comes to, by experts, less than $8 an hour. So yeah, they'd love to stitch to something. Now, they keep using numbers that are totally misleading. The numbers don't actually reflect, because we're used to a different environment. We're used to when we go to work, our employer pays all our expenses. And we're not used to one where the employer pays none of our expenses. So when you look at the studies that are out there and the compromise, which, which I was no part of, but which the compromise that was reached the other day was after dozens and dozens of meetings. The bill, the statute itself has had numerous changes merely because Uber and Lyft wanted them. And they, 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 I think they pointed to one sentence. Other than, now let's talk enforcement. Any law has to be able to be enforced. I didn't understand their complaint. They say, they say we don't want them to be able to go to district court if the contract is breached. 
and we don't want uh, we want them to have to go to arbitration but then they say but they already can do either I don't know if that's true but if it is true why would you complain I'd also like to point out I think my time's running short I'd also like to point out what we've seen here is a Herculean effort on the part of the legislators <coughs> two of whom are here and have fought very hard on this others are aren't here it was a big group everybody from Jamie Long to the ones that are here today who spearheaded it, to the people over in the Senate who worked many, many hours on this. We're very close to getting this done. We need this passed today. And we need this passed today so the final touches can be completed. Last time we were in front of you, we weren't this far. Now we are. Thank you. My time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Farhan, <coughs> Farhan Adel, and then I have Mariana Brown. And then we'll get to the amendments. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and proceed. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Farhan Badel. I've uh, been driving for five years. I'm a father of three. Uh, this is my full-time job, and we've been fighting for two long, he long years. I think uh, we've been here at the state cap capital more than any other group uh, fighting for, you know, just a fair pay. You know, that's all we're asking for. Uber and Lyft do not need the city council. They do not need the legislators uh, to give us fair pay. They can automatically do that, switch on the app, but they refuse to do that. Today, uh, what you have in front of you is a bill where the drivers have compromised a lot. In this bill here, it does not include uh, collective bargaining, which is a huge Huge compromise for the drivers. We went from $1.40 to $1.27. Another huge compromise. The question is, what have Uber and Lyft compromised? Zero. Uh, Uber's offer of 68 cents per mile is a slap in the face <clears throat> of thousands of drivers. How working drivers? Uh, what we're dealing with are two companies that are keen to continue exploiting the drivers. And you see that with the offer. Uh, let's not forget what the commissioner mentioned and what the state report mentioned was that 60% of the drivers are foreign born, people that look like me, over 60%. Thank you, Representative Hobbs. Hold on. Uh, my message here to, the, to this governing body, uh, to the state legislators, to the administration, is Uber and Lyft, especially Uber, notorious for the shady lobbying and corporate malpractice, should not be allowed to dictate what becomes law in the state. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. And then Mariana Brown, and with no applause. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and proceed. Hi, everyone. My name is Mariana Brown, and I'm part of MULDA. I just want to say one thing. Last year, before the bill was vetoed, Uber and Lyft offer $1.17 per mile to the drivers. All of a sudden, they went down to 68 cents. We, as a people, should not be dictated by big corporation of what we should pay our people. Minnesota is a state of fair wage and take care of the people. Uber and Lyft should not be the one to decide what we make. We make below poverty level at this time. And what they're saying is like, we don't need to make money. We don't need to put proper food on the table to feed our family with 68 cents a mile. Because basically, we should be eating canned goods and feeding our kids with things that's not nutritious to, to them. This is wrong, and I'm very upset by hearing the 68 cents a mile, because we went too far. I also serve on the governor's committee. We were there, and they agreed to everything, 24 out of 25 items. All of a sudden, they have amnesia or just temporary memory loss when they come to us at this table with this 68 cent. This is wrong. We should do what we need for the people of Minnesota. I see they talk about homelessness in this state. If things not done properly for these drivers, we're gonna have a lot of drivers on the street being homeless because we won't be able to pay the rent. There's a lot of drivers cannot afford to pay the rent on the little that they make. 
Uber and Lyft don't mention that it takes 60 percent of what you pay. They take 60 percent. These fares don't have to be increased. They just have to release some of the money that they take for themselves and release it back to the drivers. That's all we are asking for. Because if you pay $100 to them and the drivers get 40, they're just an app. The drivers are here. The people are here. We are the one working with our car. Mr. Carson mentioned the other day that he based, the, 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 someone asked him a question, how he based us, the Uber driver, he said, based it on the same way as a taxi driver. A taxi dr company provide a car to the drivers. They provide the gas, they provide time and everything. They don't have to put that wear and tear in their vehicle. And this is wrong, a slap in the face to us, because at the same time, we need to be taken care of. And as we could see, they don't care about us, whether we live or die. And that's what he's seeing. 68 cents, what can we do with that? We have to pay gas, insurance, all our expenses come from that 68 cents. At the end of the year, we have to pay taxes. Do you know my taxes? I owe taxes from last year. We have to pay taxes from the little that we make. So that 68 cent is not even 68 cent because we have to pay taxes back on that. And that's wrong. We need to do better and we need to approve, the, approve this bill today. And I, I implore you to take care of us as drivers because we, as you could hear, we all need it here. We drivers are needed. So show us that we are needed here and pass this bill on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we've got two amendments here. Um, we've got the A7 and the A8. Who's, this, who's got the A7? Uh, I do, Mr. Chair. Representative Myers? You want, to, uh, you want to move the amendment, then explain it. I do. Thank you. Um, you know, first, I just want to say, um, you know, thank you to all the transportation drivers, both public, private. We know how important it is, uh, the work that you do for our vital transportation system. I also do want to say thank you to the rideshare companies for, um, you know, sharing that information. I think that probably um, that much data was probably helpful um, for, you know, everybody to kind of come together and, and look at a more balanced approach. You know, this is a uh, third time we've heard this in the committee, and, and we know how important this is for Minnesota, the impact it has on, you know, uh, the, the metro, uh, the suburbs, uh, greater Minnesota. Um, you know, so what this amendment is trying to do is, is just give some, consistent, give some consistency. We, we've seen that 46 other states have statewide regulations uh, that will give a, you know, balanced approach to the implementation. Um, I, I don't think we want to see you know, dozens, 50 different laws or different rules. Um, you know, we, we want to provide that consistency uniform, not only for rideshare companies, for the workers, but the people that are using the, the services as well. Um, so what this amendment does, it, you know, it makes the um, Department of Labor the exclusive enforcement authority. Uh, I think they have the tools. I think they have the resources. And... Again, I think this is a, uh, a balanced approach, which I would um, hope you would look at it that way and accept this amendment. Representative Hussan. Representative Norwood. Norwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I think um, the A7 gives only exclusive authority to the commission of DLI in this sense. So that means no any other governmental entity has got the right to uh, pursue the enforcement under this uh, bill. So what I will say that it's not only DLI. We do have some enforcement that we're also even allowing uh, the uh, local government when there's a violation based on a few other things that I think um, they can revoke the license for TNC. And also, if there is a violation in any statute, we always allow the attorney general to do that work. So. I will ask you to vote no, because it's only giving the exclusive uh, authority to the DLI commissioner rather than any other entity that can do the same. Representative Myers. Um, thank you, Chair Noor, for that. What, what I would say is, you know, this, this is vital to the state. We've seen there's a lot of people in this room. Um, you know, we want to do what we can to provide that consistency. And, and as I said before, um, you know, the, the tools and the resources to best address this for um, an approach, both for, for riders, for, for workers, and for these rideshare companies, I think is best addressed through DLI. Um, it's too important, I think, to have you know, individual cities 
causing individual concerns that then could lead to you know, a pull out or restricted areas that don't have access to it. And, and you guys have been getting the emails that I've been getting. Um, you know, I thought some of my other, uh, you know, colleagues were getting it, but since I sit on labor, I've, I've gotten a lot more of those um, emails. But, you know, I think that they're looking for um, that stability. They're, they're looking for that <laughs> uniform enforcement approach. And I think DLI is the person and the agency to do that. So I would ask members, to support it, and I would ask for a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Um, and the clerk's ready here. Take the roll. Uh, Chair Nelson. No. Chair Nelson votes no. Uh, Vice Chair Berg. No. Vice Chair Berg votes no. Lead McDonald. Aye. Lead McDonald votes aye. Representative Daniels. Daniels votes aye. Representative Daniels votes aye. Representative Greenman. No. Representative Greenman votes no. Representative Hill. No. Representative Hill votes no. Representative Hussein. Representative Hussein votes no. Representative Hussein votes no. Representative Jordan. No. Representative Jordan votes no. Representative Kozlowski. No. Representative Kozlowski votes no. Representative Meckland. Yes. Representative Meckland votes aye. Representative Myers. Aye. Representative Myers votes aye. Representative Schultz is excused. Representative Wolgamont. No. Representative Wolgamont votes no. There are four ayes and eight noes. With four ayes and eight noes, the, uh, the motion does not prevail. Next, I have an A8 amendment. Chair, that's my amendment. Representative McDonald, do you want to move your amendment? I'd like to move my the A8 amendment. And explain it. Uh, the A8 amendment is a simple amendment. It, it uh, removes the private right of action. And the reason for that is if uh, if the contract is breached by the drivers in the in the company, uh, you have an opportunity to have a private right of action. It sounds good, right? It's our private right. It's our private uh, God-given right to take action against a company that maybe breached the contract. Sounds great but it's expensive and it's time consuming and it only lined the pockets of our good lawyers in the state. In the bill already, we have a arbitration process through the Department of Labor who are getting $100,000 per year to help facilitate this bill should it become law. Arbitration is quicker, it's safer, it's more fair, it'll save time and money and you'll have the Department of Labor that'll do the work for you. The private right of action, although it sounds appealing, it is not necessary. Already in the bill, agreed upon, gives all those drivers the right to arbitration should they feel that they have been uh, unjust <clears throat> in a uh, deactivation or a cause or break in the contract. Should this fail, just know, and if the bill becomes law, this private right of action should there be an infringement on the contract, which there always will, there shall be, that's human to err is human, something's going to be wrong, a driver may be unjustly deactivated or justly. They still will have that right to fight yeah. for their own job, their own career, their own self-employment, God-given rights. But to you drivers, no, it'll be costly and time-consuming. Already in the bill is a provision that'll give you the arbitration, the time to fight this with the Department of Labor. I just need you, I hope that you understand that, as I am continuing to understand it myself. I'm not an attorney, but I do understand that this, deleting the private right of action gives the drivers and the companies as well an opportunity to uh, proceed through the process fairly, quicker, more accurately, and less expensive, and less time consuming to be dragging through the courts, lining the pockets of our good attorneys in our state. So with that, uh, representative, uh, representatives both, I hope that you will accept this friendly amendment and know that it will only improve the quality of your bill. Representative Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Lead uh, McDonald. Uh, thank you for the conversation yesterday about this bill and um, the work that we're doing for drivers across the state. Um, everything in the bill came from this study, except two things that the drivers said are very important to them. 
And I want to say one thing about consensus. So I was not in the task force, but people who are in the task force informed me that consensus was reached if there was 100% agreement on the item. These two items in the bill were important to the drivers, but not important to the TNC companies. So that's the reason why these two were not part of the recommendation from the task force. It's important to the drivers. We have heard from drivers that were beaten, that were gunned down, that were robbed at a gunpoint, that were deactivated for no reason, while somebody lies in the hospital trying to recover from gunshot wounds. They were deactivated and had no access to reactivate it. Uh, so I really think that we should keep this in the bill um, because it's important to the drivers that we have this enforcement, and it's a language that was worked on back and forth with the TNC companies as well as uh, DLI, as well as other members of, of uh, the um, executive um, members of our um, the governor's office. So I, I, while I really think that um, I would love to accept it, but I, I say vote no because this is the only two things that are important to the drivers other than pay was this two enforcement that they will have in case there, if this continues, the exploitation continues, the lack of protection continues, and their lives are put in jeopardy. Thank you. Representative Myers. Yeah, thank you, Chair Nelson. Just to add a couple of, um, you know, things to think about. I, I would say that, you know, there is a, a potential likelihood that this is going to, you know, violate the, the Arbitration Act. And, and the other piece is that that opportunity is still there to, to go to court. DLI can, can go to court and enforce the stuff that needs to be enforced. And so uh, I would just make sure that we take that into account. Seeing no further discussion, Representative. Mr. Chair, yeah, I'd like to request a roll call. A roll call being requested. We'll have a roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the reason I request a roll call, because I think it's important for the record to know that uh, we are in support of, of the arbitration process and the ability for the workers, the, uh, the, our self-employed, I'm self-employed as well when I'm not in this building here, um, to have the opportunity to litigate or to sue if we think an injustice is done by our company that we are working for, right? This particular amendment does not take that away. Right. And it gives, the, it gives the ability for arbitration, which is more flexible quicker turnaround times. You have the Department of Labor to back you up. And it does not negate whatsoever your ability if you are uh, unjustly deactivated or unjustly fired or whatever the case may be, a complaint against your uh, company, it's not an employer, right? The uh, still, still ability to sue or to uh, challenge whatever uh, charge may be cased against you. But arbitration is better. And we're already paying with our tax dollars the Department of Labor to go to court with you, to help you arbitrate. So with that, thank you, uh, Representative, that you would like to take my amendment, but you chose not to, but I appreciate at least your kindness in that. And with that, uh, roll call had been called. Roll call being called for. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Nelson? No. Chair Nelson votes no. Uh, Vice Chair Berg? No. Vice Chair Berg votes no. Lead McDonald? Aye. Lead McDonald votes aye. Representative Daniels? Representative Daniels votes aye. Representative Greenman? No. Representative Greenman votes no. Representative Hill? Hill no. Representative Hill votes no. Representative Hussein? No. Representative Hussein votes no. Representative Jordan? No. Representative Jordan votes no. Representative Kozlowski? No. Representative Kozlowski votes no. Representative Meckland? Aye. Representative Meckland votes aye. Representative Myers? Aye. Representative Myers votes aye. Representative Schultz is excused. Rep uh, Representative Wolgamont? No. Representative Wolgamont votes no. There are four ayes and eight nays. With four ayes and eight nays, the motion does not prevail. Um, discussion. I have on the list here Representative Hussein. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and I want to thank. Representative Hassan and uh, uh, Chair Noor, their dedication and hard work for this bill. And this is not the first time we heard this bill. Like this is the third time that we are getting this bill uh, coming in front of us. I want to thank also all the unions and all the testifiers who showed up 
and share their stories uh, with us today. And uh, we heard a lot. We heard like uh, uh, there's no sick pay, they pay for repair car, they pay for the gas, they pay for the insurance, they pay for the car payment. On top of that, they pay for tax for both employee and employer. And uh, we heard some of the testifiers say uh, they get paid the company $48 and they take away home $8. And that is unacceptable. It's, it's less than 15% of, of, of the pay. And, and that is a ripoff, and that is not something that we can tolerate in the labor. This is not the bill, first bill that we heard. We also, I want to thank uh, our Representative uh, Wagama, who brought up uh, uh, a meat pack, and we hold accountable. And uh, there's so many other. Uh, bills that came similar to this, that uh, the airport issue and uh, what was it, uh, Amazon, uh, Ms. Greenman, uh, Representative Greenman uh, brought it forward. We hold them accountable and uh, we fixed. This is not a different than any other bills. We know that the minority people, 60% are the people of color who is asking <coughs> fair pay, asking, uh, um, protection and not asking a lot. Uh, they're not getting paid. Uh, I heard some of the testifiers had say they're getting 50, 50, $52.95 per an hour. And I don't know how to that math, where's that math is coming from when they're getting paid $8 or less uh, for, for them to drive like uh, for a mile. And that could be uh, 15 minutes or like it could be 20 minutes if it's a rush hours. Those are unacceptable. Uh, we, we had like some of the testifiers say they get paid 70%. And I would like to ask uh, uh, Joe Carlson if he could come down here and explain it to me and walk me through how the number that he come up to 52.9 an hour when some of the testifiers saying that they have uh, $8 for uh, uh, four mile. That doesn't make sense to me. And I would like to see if you can uh, walk us through Mr. how, Carlson, how they could get paid uh, $52 an hour when uh, the driver is driving 15 minutes or 20 minutes uh, uh, for, for, for miles. Mr. Mr. Carlson. Mr. Chairman and Representative, I'm happy to take this offline and, and walk it. Um, uh, and walk you through it. But when you look at the numbers in the report and you look at the average car payment and you look at the average um, uh, amount of drive time and you look at how they calculate all of their insurance and all of the car payment and all of the cell phone, um, they make the assumption that the drivers wouldn't have a cell phone, wouldn't have insurance, wouldn't have a car unless they were driving for a TNC. We think that's unfair and we think it's unrealistic. We know they use their car for personal use that's one of the things in the report. And I didn't offer that as a number. What I said is when you, when you look at reasonable assumptions about how um, uh, we operate, um, uh, that that's the number that you come up with. We've offered significant um, um, uh, numbers in the past, and we'll continue to do that. My point, though, um, uh, was that when you, and you can ask the commissioner to come up, that report is the most favorable report you can have for the drivers and the most favorable assumptions for the drivers uh, that you can come up with. And when you use those favorable numbers, the rate that the state has come up with uh, uh, is 49 cents a mile and 89 cents a minute. Representative Hussein, if you want to wrap up your, your comments. <laughs> Uh, 40, 49.89. That's in the most favorable light. Uh, that's the point, and and I'm happy to take this offline with you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, and I want to thank all the testifiers, and and I'm here for you, and we'll make sure that uh, justice and fair pay and protection, as long as we are here. And I would like to call a roll call. Thank a you. A roll sir. call's been requested. We'll have a roll call. Our representative Greenman is the next person. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, um, and uh, Represent or Mr. Carlson, and I think Mr. Reich. I have a few questions for you to clarify to pick up where I think my colleague uh, 
Representative uh, Hassan um, uh, Hussein um, uh, left off, because I think one of the challenges we have here is um, in this whole conversation, there seems to be a lack of transparency around um, one, how much drivers are making, two, how much consumers are getting paid, and three, how those prices are being set. I think that that's um, uh, where we're at. I do, before just asking a few questions, want to clarify, I think, what you said, which is this bill is actually silent on the issue of uh, whether folks are employers or independent contractors, and there's language to that effect. Um, I know that that's a conversation for a different day, uh, but I do want to just make sure folks uh, uh, note the language in 15.11. Um, one of my questions, and I guess I'm going to sort of package these together in the interest of time, um, but it would be, I think, helpful for the committee to know um, when, um, when we're talking about these rates, and I think that the, the, to the point of there's lots of agreement on the other pieces and the really important pieces of the bill, we've heard that from drivers um, particularly, but when we talk about rates, um, it would be helpful to know from, from you both, um, one, who decides how much a customer is sort of offered in terms of their fare, who decides on how much the worker um, gets paid, and what that percentage of the cut that the company takes um, as part of that. And if we can be quick with our answer, because we're running out of time here, and we have to be done at 1030, and we will be voting on this before 1030. Yeah. So quickly. It was um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Freeman. Just want to make sure you're clear what I said. I said the report treats them as independent contractors. I didn't say the bill treats them that way. The report treats them that way with full self-employment tax, full uh, IRS <coughs> deduction for business mileage. That's the point that I made. Um, not that the bill did that. Um, uh, rates are dynamically set. We don't pay by the minute or the mile. They're dynamically set. There are trips right now where uh, the company subsidized the rate because they want that ride to happen. And the, and the driver gets paid more because it's a trip that they want to have um, um, uh, and the service they want to make. There are other trips where the demand is high and, uh, and, the, and the price fluctuates. So as far as who sets the rate, the company set that. Um, and I can't tell you on every single trip what the percentage is because in there is, for Minnesota, we pay over $20 million a year in insurance. Uh, we pay $3.50 in and $3.50 out every time we go to the airport. Uh, all of those things go into what the, what the rider pays, but we're a publicly traded company, and you can look at their SEC filing and find out how much they make, what they take from fares, and it's about 19%, and that's in their SEC filing. So, you know, it's a knowable number, and, uh, um, and so... To me, that's probably the best indication of what it is. But there are a lot of expenses. This is uh, this idea that you can start up this business and buy an insurance policy. That's uh, yeah, it's a, it's over 10 percent of every ride just to pay the insurance, uh, the current insurance uh, in Minnesota, not what we've agreed to even in this bill. We have the most beneficial insurance package in the state, and I want you to know that drivers are covered today when they're injured uh, while they're driving. Um, and this will supplement that. Um, um, Mr. Carlson, and, if you can wrap yeah, up yeah, like yeah. that. I Sorry, got... Matt, we, again, we can take this up. But there you go. Mr. Mr. Wright, short, quickly. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members, Representative Greenman. So as I mentioned earlier in my comments, drivers, Lyft's new policy as of February of this year means that in aggregate over the course of a week, a driver will not earn less than 70% of the fare. And so uh, just... Basically, on driver earnings, uh, fares fluctuate, as Mr. Carlson said, based on demand. We're, compete, we're competitors, so we want rides to happen. We may, as, as Mr. Carlson said, offer uh, sales, bonuses, things like that. We also incent drivers to take rides at high demand times, or if there's a big, you know, let's say the Twins game lets out, send dri you know, incent drivers to go that way as well. So there's, the prices are dynamic. The company sets the rates. Our policy is that we will not make less than 70% after fees. Average fees or, or costs is about 24% is uh, insurance, fees, others. And our uh, Lyft wage report that we released in February this year shows that on average drivers get about 88% of the fare. One. I've got, we'll come back to you because I've got other people on the list and we're running out of time. Representative Myers. Thank you. With and ask short questions. If you ask minute-long questions, 
Oh, you know me. I'm quick. Um, <laughs> would the commissioner be willing to come up and answer two questions? Welcome back, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Um, Commissioner, do you feel the rate report is favorable to drivers? Commissioner. Um, so the study that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, um, the study that we conducted uh, looked at the at actual Minnesota data. We had all of the trips in the year 2022, which I mentioned earlier was over 18 million. We also were able to conduct a driver survey that we had um, a very good response rate on to look at what drivers were actually paying for things like car maintenance and cleaning and cell phones and um, lease rates and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I would say is the, the study is based on Minnesota specific data. Where we had to make assumptions, um, we did tend to look at uh, pro-driver assumptions and assume that the people that we are trying to help with the minimum compensation are the drivers that are making a living doing this. So we uh, excluded the, uh, the casual drivers from the study. Um, we focused on the more committed drivers uh, and we also um, made assumptions that, that ensured that the drivers that did choose to make a living out of this would see that their expenses are covered and that they were earning at least Minneapolis minimum wage. Thank you. Meyer. And a follow up to that, you know, I, in this and across the aisle, I'm always willing to try to, you know, work and, you know, bring some solutions forward to have those discussions. Um, I know I wasn't part of any of those discussions. I don't know if anybody from this side of the aisle was part of those discussions. Um, the question I would have for you is, um, you know, were you part of the negotiations for the, the wage and the DE amendment? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative, I was not. Uh, one final question. Final question, quick. Yeah, final question. Um, does the governor support this rate? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, the governor has been very clear that what he supports is a minimum compensation that is supported by the DLI study um, and that ensures that drivers receive an increase in minimum compensation and also ensures that the service remains in uh, for the citizens of Minnesota. Thank you. Representative McDonald. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think we have one minute left. I'll ask no questions. Talks a little slow, a little fast. But <laughs> oh, it is fast. Okay. Well, um, but not that fast. Yes. You know, after studying this issue for uh, I think over a year now, just talking with the riders and Representative Hassan and Representative Hussein and others about this issue and the importance of it, and the the folks that represent uh, Lyft and Uber, uh, you've come to uh, you did a lot of work. And you have some victories. There's some victories here in this bill. The 24 uh, provisions that are agreed upon with Lyft and Uber is a victory for all Minnesota. <coughs> Nobody's going to get every, everything they want. We know that in politics. But be careful if you continue to go with the rates in which you think is best. You know, President Reagan said that government isn't the solution to the problem. Government is the problem. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's not. In this case, it's a little bit of both. Together, the drivers, Uber and Lyft, our lawmakers came together to make sure that things were better for the drivers, and that's good. But if you push too hard, if you go too far in the amount, only what will happen in Minnesota will happen in Seattle and other states. The proof is in the pudding. We know that in Seattle, when they did this very same thing, drivers drove less, riders rode less, they made less money, and it cost more to drive, so people used the, the app less. You will make less money. You won't drive as much. That is the proof. That is going to happen. It's not uh, an alarmist. It's not uh, hyperbole. It's not uh, a tin hat. It's what's happened in other states. The company that brought this wonderful technology to our co country and to the world, Uber and Lyft, what an amazing gift. What an idea, I wish I would have thought of it. Only for the gift of the cell phone and, mm -hmm. and that, you could call up an app and have a driver pick you up. I was stuck down to the Loon Cafe last week. I took a scooter down there and it was raining, so I had to, I had to get back. So I, I went on my Uber 
app, which we don't have in Wright County, or at least Delano, where I live, there's no Uber drivers. And within three, four minutes, the driver was there. Uh, Hussein was his name, great guy. Uh, drove me to the Capitol, but it was affordable. I tipped him very well. By the way, we didn't even talk about tips. Minnesotans are very tip happy. We, we like to tip, and we're very generous. That's not even considered in the, in the final. But had it been, if the cost, I'm, I'll close this, Mr. Chair. If they say what is true, that the cost could raise up 18 to 25 percent, I will not, and many, many others, just simply won't, can't use the uh, program. It will be too costly, and it will diminish the driver's ability to make a living. And that's what it's all about. You've got great victories. Representative Hassan, congratulations to working with companies and the drivers in our state to take your victory. If you go too far, Uber and Lyft said they will leave. So, as one of our testifiers who the driver said, the future of thousands of workers and their families are in our hands. I turn that back to you, Representative Hassan. And Representative Hassan, if you want to wrap up, and then uh, to a vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I just want to, you know, leave you with the words of uh, John Lewis. The workers of the nation were tired of waiting for corporate industry to do their their economic wrongs, to right their economic wrongs, to alleviate their social agony and to grant them rights. Despairing of fair um, treatment, they resolve to do something for themselves. And that, Mr. Chair, this is what the, these drivers are doing. And I want to say, if your business model relies on keeping people in poverty, you do not have a viable business in Minnesota. I hope you can all support this bill. And with that, Representative Hussein. Renews his motion that House File 4746, as amended, be re referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. And the clerk will take the roll. Roll calls the Chair Nelson. Aye. Chair Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Berg. Aye. Vice Chair Berg votes aye. Lead McDonald. Uh, nay. Lead McDonald votes no. Representative Daniels. Daniels votes no. Representative Daniels votes no. Representative Greenman. Aye. Representative Greenman votes aye. Representative Hill. Aye. Representative Hill votes aye. Representative Hussein. Aye. Representative Hussein votes aye. Representative Jordan. Aye. Representative Jordan votes aye. Representative Kozlowski. Aye. Representative Kozlowski votes aye. Representative Meckland. No. Representative Meckland votes no. <laughs> Representative Myers. Nay. Representative Myers votes no. Representative Schultz is excused. Representative Wolgamont. Aye. Representative Wolgamont votes aye. There are eight A's and four not nays. With eight A's and four nays, the motion prevails. The bill is on its way to Ways and Means. Um, with that, members, this is our last meeting. No clapping, please. This is our last meeting. I want to thank our staff here for all the good work they've done over the year. Our, both our nonpartisan our partisan staff on both sides for the great job that they did, and the members for being respectful and allowing me to run a good committee. Thank you all. With that, we're adjourned.